This conference will now be recorded. All right. Welcome to this year short course of machine learning for weather and climate applications. And, you know, I realized later that there's some of you who also work on other environmental science applications. And the weather and climate application really comes from the fact that Ryan and I work a lot in these areas. So that's why we put it in the title. But it certainly applies also to other environmental science applications. So, Ryan, do you just want to introduce yourself? Let's just go to the second slide where people actually see a picture of you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how much introduction you want me to give. Um, so, I'm Ryan Lagerquist. I'm currently a postdoc working with CIRA, but I'm also affiliated with NOAA, ESBRL, slash GSL, so the Earth Systems Resource Lab, slash Global Systems Lab. Yeah, I'm not going to read off all the acronyms. There's a lot. Um, so I recently graduated from University of Oklahoma back in April, working under Amy McGovern, and I've been doing machine learning applications and atmospheric science for the last eight and a half years now, starting off with Environment Canada and Edmonton doing stuff for their forecasting office back in 2012 and uh, continuing to now in my postdoc. All right. And I am Emma ebert Opoff, and I'm a research professor in electrical and computer engineering at Colorado State University. And I'm also the machine learning lead part-time, uh, half of my time, I'm the machine learning lead for CIRA at Fort Collins. Um, and I've worked in, at the intersection of data science and climate and visor applications for about 10 years. A lot of that was causal discovery and later more machine learning. All right. So um, today's lecture, I start out and I will at some point turn it over more to Ryan, who will discuss, discuss more of the last parts of it. So we're going to talk just today, giving kind of giving you kind of a lightweight overview of machine learning, specifically for weather and climate applications. So the first part I'm going to talk about is machine learning is magic, or at least it seems that way sometimes. And then I will talk about how machine learning is not magic. Then uh, Ryan will talk about the most common machine learning methods in weather and climate. We both will talk about examples of machine learning use at CIRA, NOAA, and series. So we have 10 different applications, one side each, to give you an idea of what it's actually used for. Uh, and then we'll just give an overview of future lectures, and Ryan will talk about working with Colab notebooks. That's really just for people who haven't used Colab notebooks, but you get a feeling for it, and we will really start working with those next time. And the goals of today's lecture are to give you a taste of what machine learning is all about. And that includes the good and the bad. Also introducing a bit of machine learning vocabulary and acronyms, because sometimes you see a paper and there's an acronym and you just don't know what it is. And once somebody explains it to you, you really, it, it's not that hard. So look for terms in red throughout today. Those are just vocabulary and acronyms for machine learning. And also giving you a feeling of sample applications on climate and weather. So part one. Machine learning is magic, also known as the seemingly endless or limitless opportunities of machine learning. And by the way, if you have any quick questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions because some other people might have the same questions. And so we'll be happy to take the questions right away. The longer ones may be hold for later. We'll have plenty of time for questions later on. But if you have a quick question, feel free to just unmute and jump in. All right, starting with vocabulary. Um, lots of people use the term AI for artificial intelligence, other people use machine learning. And we just wanted to spend a second here talking about the differences between those. Um, and of course, lots of people talk about artificial neural networks. So first of all, ANN means artificial neural network, ML means machine learning, AI means artificial intelligence. And if you look at the diagram on the top right, artificial neural networks are a subgroup of machine learning. It's one type of machine learning. And machine learning is a subgroup of AI. So really traditionally, AI means you're trying to create machines that work and react in intelligent ways. So that's a fairly abstract concept. Really think Robocop, you know, your independent robot walking around, finding its way in the world and thinking. So that's artificial intelligence. And that's usually not really what we're talking about. Usually what we're talking about is machine learning, which is just a subset of this much more abstract artificial intelligence concept. However, these days, if you want to get funding, most people use the term AI because it sounds so much cooler. So, you know, it's fine to say AI when you mean machine learning because it's a more general term. 
But if you want to be more technical, you probably want to say machine learning. Because machine learning is a subset of AI that includes algorithms that enable a computer to automatically learn from experience, primarily from data samples, without being explicitly programmed. Again, it's a subset of AI, and that's what we typically want for weather and climate applications, because we want fairly limited intelligence. We still want to know what our, new, what our machine learning method is doing. So AI sounds more impressive, but machine learning is probably the more concise term. And then again, an artificial neural network is probably the most popular and well-known machine learning method that gets also the most hype. Uh, it's a very versatile and powerful machine learning method, and it can be seen as a universal function generator. And we'll definitely talk about artificial neural networks, among other things, a lot. Many other methods exist, but the neural networks pop up everywhere these days. So there's lots of potential for weather and climate. Um, and so potential applications include a prediction task, especially for very complex nonlinear relationships with high dimensional input space, where linear re regression is just not going to cut it. So examples are if you're trying to estimate cloud-based height from satellite images, or you're trying to predict smoke or wind or humidity. Those are all prediction tasks where the output is something continuous. In contrast, the classification task is something where the output, what you're trying to estimate, is usually is something discrete. So for example, which cloud type is this? Is this stratiform convective or something else? Or is this a small, medium, or high value of wind? Or something like this, anything where the output is discrete. Other typical tasks are object detection. You might ask, oh, here's an image. Is there a hurricane or an atmospheric river in the image? If so, where is it? How big is it? How intense is it? But that would be a classification task. Um, anomaly detection, is there anything unusual happening? You know, severe weather, heat waves, cold snaps, climate change, bad data. These might all be things that you want to detect from some kind of input. And then another one we we'll talk a little about is subgrid scale parameterization. So you may want to speed up calculation or improve accuracy, for example, to speed up radiative transfer parameterization for numerical weather prediction. So, first, what is machine learning? Um, so the goal of classic machine learning is to extract some kind of useful information from a set of data samples. And the results can either be a model or it can be a set of rules or patterns or other useful information. The most common one that we see overwhelmingly is some kind of a model. And I just want to put this here on the slide because what we mean by model here is really different from what people often mean by model in atmospheric sciences. Here, model simply means this is some kind of algorithm that takes some kind of input, say x, and converts it to some kind of output, and that's y. And so the machine learning model basically learns from data what this input-output relationship is. The simplest one would be a linear regression model. You train it on input-output vectors, you come up with a linear regression model, here you go. And the machine learning model is just a generalization of that basic principle. Another outcome of machine learning can be a set of rules, such as temperatures are lower at night or some connection between ENSO and MGO. Um, of course, this first one is a silly rule that we already knew, but you can extract rules like that also from data. Or you can ex extract a, a pattern. So for example, you could feed in uh, global annually averaged temperature maps into neural network and you could try to have it find specific patterns across the globe indicating climate change. So what can the input and output be? So usually it's an input-output pair, which we also call supervised learning. Um, the, x, the x and the y can represent any type of data here. It can be discrete. Each one of them can be discrete or continuous, a scalar, a vector, an image, a time series, and any combination of the above. And so I mentioned before, linear regression, that's actually considered a machine learning method. So if you know linear regression, you already know a machine learning method. It's probably the simplest one there is, but since it uh, satisfies the definition of machine learning models, that is one of them. All right, a little bit more vocabulary. Um, so if you have such input-output pairs, and you know what the out output should be for your samples, you call this a labeled data set, and the output itself is called a label. So the output can be 
a prediction value or a label that this is a stratiform cloud or this is a different type of cloud. And whenever you have these pairs, you call this supervised learning because you're supervising the algorithm by telling it the correct answer should have been such and such. And so you can always measure your error at the output. And there, so the great majority of our time we will spend on supervised learning. Um, and there are two types of machine learning mo models for supervised learning. They have so-called regression tasks, where the output is continuous, what I called the prediction task before. And the examples are estimated precipitation, storm intensity, brightness temperature, that kind of stuff. Anything that has a continuous value. And the other type is a classification task, where the output is discrete, representing different categories. Is this the convective cloud stratiform? Is there a cyclone in this image? Yes or no? And it can be binary, but it can also have many different states. Okay, so that's just for vocabulary. So now, this is a diagram how most machine learning methods are kind of organized. So you have machine learning at the top, and then you have on the left-hand side, you have supervised learning, and on the right-hand side, you have unsupervised learning. So again, supervised learning is when you have your input-output pair. So you know what the output should be, what the exact answer should be that the algorithm should provide. Um, and there, as we just said, there are two types. There's regression, where the output is continuous, and there's classification, where the output is discrete. And you probably already know a machine learning method for regression, which is just linear regression. And one for classification, which is quite often logistic regression. What's unsupervised learning? Let's look on the right-hand side over here. So one classic example of unsupervised learning is dimensionality reduction. And I'm sure you've all seen PCA or EOFF, things like that. So that's a classic example of dimensionality reduction where you don't have these input-output pairs. You're basically trying to, to do machine learning here without having a correct answer. Another example of unsupervised learning is clustering, where you also don't have a correct answer. You're trying to group your samples into similar groups of samples. So K means clustering is a typical example of those. So are these all kinds of machine learning algorithms? If you already know them, can we go home now? There are actually a lot more. And this is not even an exhaustive list. But if you go into machine learning supervised learning, you look at regression, where you already saw linear regression. There's also K nearest neighbors. There's random forest, there are neural networks. If you go into classification, there's discriminant analysis, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Naive base, support vector machines, logistic regression, also random forest, gradient boosted forest, and neural networks. If you look on the unsupervised side, the most popular clustering algorithms are k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering, and self-organizing maps. And for dimensionality reduction, the most popular ones are PCA and neural networks. Which ones of those are we going to cover in this class? Everything that you see in blue with the red box around it. So linear regression, random forest, and neural networks for regression. Logistic regression, random forest, graded boosted forest, and neural networks for classification. K-means clustering, hierarchical clustering for clustering, and neural networks for dimensionality reduction. All right. That brings us to part two. I just told you all the wonderful things that you can use machine learning for. So it seems like magic, but it's not really magic. And I just want to show you some pitfalls and some costs and dangers of using machine learning because you should, you should not use machine learning for everything. So here's a classic story of Clever Hans. Clever Hans was a German horse in 1907 that was believed to know arithmetic. And you have to imagine this was shortly after Charles Darwin published a lot of his publications and people were getting all excited about animal intelligence. And here was this horse that could do arithmetic. And even the owner thought it knew arithmetic. Uh, he wasn't cheating. He just really thought that the, the horse knew arithmetic. And it would answer questions by tapping its hoof the right number of times. It could addition, addition subtraction, division, multiplication, and it got it mostly right. And it turned out that even if other people asked the horse questions, the horse got it right too. And it actually took a bunch of scientists to analyze the horse to figure out what kind of cue it was using. Because of course it was using some subconscious cues of the person asking the question. It actually turned out that, a, that a person, that most people, when they ask a question like this, they kind of tense up while the horse is tapping. And once the horse gets to the right number, they relax. And that's what the horse was using as a cue, even for people that it didn't know. 
So the key point here is clever hands gave the right answer, but for the wrong reason. Clearly, it didn't know arithmetic, but there was a strong correlation between the person asking the question, the behavior, and it picked up on the correlation to the correct answer right there, right? Because the person's behavior was correlated to what the right answer should be. Turns out in machine learning, you can also get clever hand strategies because machine learning methods can also pick up the wrong correlations that don't generalize. And I'm gonna give you some examples from a paper and the paper is shown here, it's a great paper. Um, and the task they consider here is object recognition. So they train a machine learning algorithm to detect many different objects and images. And the method used here is a neural network, also known as a NN neural network. And specific tasks that they analyze in the paper is how does a neural network decide whether there is a horse in an image? And which strategies does it use to decide that? So the method that they used for analyzing these strategies is a neural network realization technique called layer-wise relevance propagation, usually named LRP, layer-wise relevance propagation, which constructs attribution maps. And let me show you how this works. So they were looking at this algorithm that was fed these images at the top. So these are the input images to the neural network. And the analysis algorithm then looked at when the neural network was deciding that there was a horse in the image. And for those two images, it decided that there was a horse. Where was it actually paying attention in the input image to decide that? So that gives you for each image an attribution map where red areas are increased confidence that there is a horse in the image and blue are decreased confidence and the black areas are not deemed useful. And so if you look at where it was looking and you line this up, so this one is really the horses here on the left. This one is a little bit of this horse, and this is a little bit of this horse. And there are some other red areas, but mainly also here, it's mainly picking up body parts of the horses. So the neural network detects many parts of horses, which is an excellent strategy if you're trying to figure out whether there's a horse in an image. So that was one strategy they found that the neural network had learned. What else did it learn? Let's look at this one. Look at the input images and look at the attribution map here. What is it picking up? It's not picking or barely picking up the horse. It's picking up the poles, right? Because the main red area here aligns with the poles. And the same thing over here, the main red area aligns with the poles. So the neural network for these images actually didn't learn to detect the horse, it learned to detect the poles. And that's of course for the reasoning, the neural network is being too clever, like clever hunts, because if there's a pole, but no horse, it would still say there's a horse in the image. So this can easily lead to false positives and false alarms. But in all the data that it had seen, there, it was the case that whenever there were poles, there was a horse. It wasn't, it wasn't given any images that had poles, but no horses. So it, it's a false generalization, right? Uh, the third strategy is even more interesting. If you wonder what it was detecting here, there are no poles. What did it detect? Three different images. What does it look at? The bottom left of each image. Turns out that the copyright notice. So it turns out that the people who constructed this database had used this one database for horses, something that had an HTML tag and copyright notice at the bottom. And the neural network was also clever and figured out, oh, Whenever the specific copyright notice pops up at the bottom left, there's a horse in an image in the image. And so sure enough, it learned another faulty strategy. And this one would probably lead to lots of false negatives or misses because in the real world, you're not gonna get, gonna get an HTML tag with your picture that says this is a horse. So let's look at that for a moment. I mean, the neural network was just as clever as the horse. It was looking for correlations that were in the data that had to do its task. So it gave the right result, but for the wrong reason. But you shouldn't blame the algorithm for that, right? Because the algorithm did exactly what it was supposed to do, namely to discover and use the most helpful correlations and patterns in the data to perform the task that it was given. So what happened here? Well, again, some correlations were present in the data, but they were not representative of the real world. For example, an image can contain a pole without containing a horse, and a real, image, real world image would not have HTML tags. And these examples might seem silly, but similar situations can happen very easily in meteorology. So for example, 
large hair mainly gets reported in highly populated areas because if nobody is living there, nobody can report that they saw a large hair. Should we conclude from that data, from such observations, that large hail only occurs in high population areas? Of course not. It just happens to look like that in the data due to the observation bias. So it's an incorrect correlation in data, and so you would get an incorrect generalization if you would just feed it in like this. So such inadvertent correlations can happen very easily. Census may only be available in certain areas at certain times, et cetera, et cetera, which may lead to correlations in the data that are not really representative of the whole real world. How do you avoid this? Well, first of all, I think what that made clear is that you should never use machine learning methods completely as a black box. It's just not a good idea because they can learn these faulty correlations. And it's also, it's a tricky business because, you know, you want the neural network to pick up things that you didn't know about. You want it to pick up patterns that you didn't see before. Maybe it picks up something that you can learn from, but at the same time, it may also pick up something that's a faulty strategy. So you always want to use the simplest and most transparent model possible to prevent this. And you want to find ways to merge your expert knowledge to guide and constrain the machine learning methods to result in simpler and more transparent models. And we can talk more about this later. But fortunately, you also have detection algorithms. So for example, you want to do really rigorous testing of the machine learning behavior for different meteorological conditions before you run it operationally, obviously. But you also want to apply machine learning interpretation methods like the one you just saw to learn about the algorithm's reasoning so that you understand as, as best possible how the neural network is coming up with its answers. And this is truly a collaborative task. The environmental scientists are really essential in addition to the AI experts to prevent such faulty reasoning because they know much better which meteorological conditions to test for, etc. All right, going a little deeper into this, I just want to stress the importance of the environmental scientist here. And lots of people think, oh, the AI expert is going to come in and solve the problem and, and we will be useless. Nothing could be further from the truth because an AI expert or ML expert really can't do the job alone in, in any way. So we really need really strong co collaborations between machine learning experts and environmental scientists because the ML expert alone would not know which variables to choose, how to pre-process the data, which cost functions to choose, which tests to perform, how to interpret the results, et cetera, et cetera. So the role of the environmental scientist is crucial in all steps of machine learning algorithm development. Just wanna make that very clear. Okay, um, some other costs of machine learning. Um, here are just two slides that talk about the trade-offs for different methods. And this graph is not to, stay in any, not to scale in any way, but what you see here is the x-axis has simplicity and the y-axis has complexity, which are kind of opposing things, but you can think of, of different machine learning tools being along this curve over here. So linear regression is the simplest one. Decision trees probably are the next ones and support vector machines. Then come simple neural networks, random forest. You can argue which one comes first. And then you can go more and more complex to get to deep learning. And here are just some of the trade-offs between those methods. So here, you know, linear regression, you can debate whether that's a machine learning method or not, but here are the more traditional statistical methods. And then you get more and more complex over here. These methods actually have a lot of advantages, the simple ones. So if you go to the bottom right here near linear regression decision trees, you need very few parameters to learn. They're very simple. They're very robust, they don't break easily. They have very predictable behavior. If you use a linear regression model, if you feed something in, you can predict very easily what's going to come out of it. There's not going to be any surprises, right? But they can capture only simple patterns. But on the other hand, they're naturally transparent. And you usually only need few training samples because there are only few parameters in there, like a few regression parameters that you have to train to learn. So because of that, you don't need that many samples. If you go along this curve to the other extreme, you may find that deep learning may, for lots of things, give you higher accuracy. And you know, you may need something like this if you have to model nonlinear and complex patterns, especially spatial patterns. You may need something like this, but as we just saw, faulty reasoning can happen. You have a much higher computation cost for learning the model, usually not for running it, usually just for learning it, but still. You may need very many labeled samples, which are often hard to come by. 
We don't have that many hurricanes to learn from, right? And there are many, there are many parameters to choose, which is mainly the reason why you need so many labels, right? So those are the trade-offs. So as the last slide for this part, here are just some questions to ask yourself before you use machine learning. So the first question you should probably ask yourself is why do I want to use machine learning for my application? Do I want to increase speed? Do I want to increase accuracy? Do I want to do this because everybody else does it and it seems so cool? That may or may not be the best reason. Um, and always compare your machine learning uh, algorithms to some simple baseline. Don't go, if linear regression does it, there's no reason to use mach machine learning, more complex machine learning. Furthermore, when you formulate your machine learning task, rather than looking at it as one big task, you may ask yourself, can I break it up into, into subtasks and only use machine learning for some of the subtasks? So kind of only go the last mile with machine learning and maybe do some image processing before or something. Do I already know the strategy the algorithm should use? Could I solve the task manually as a human? And that's often the case in feature detection. Or is there another algorithm used to date? And if so, how would I or the algorithm do it? And which pieces of information such as features and variables are most important? And can I set up my machine learning method to use a similar strategy? And that goes back into the whole question of transparency and using as much physics as you can because you want to solve as much as you can with physics because you know that's not going to be faulty. And then possibly only go the last mile with machine learning. And that includes which variables you use and how you use them and how you set up your, your whole algorithm. Goes into feature engineering, similar topic. Can I pre-process my data, et cetera? Uh, what trade-offs do I want for my application? How much control do I want to have over my algorithm's behavior? Do I want something that's simpler and more transparent? Or do I want something that's absolutely accurate or, or much more accurate, but um, might not be as transparent? So, and then very, very important, the last one before you even start on a machine learning task, how many samples do I have? And how many of them are labeled? Because if you don't have a lot of samples, you don't get very far with complex machine learning algorithms. And do I trust my labels 100%? We often find out oh, machine learning does something weird. Yeah, but that's because there were some, some mistakes in the labels. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to Ryan. Well, maybe I should okay, so... ask whether there are any questions at this point. Any questions? Seems not. Okay, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, sure. For future reference, because I don't think everyone was here at the beginning, if you have a question that, if, if you're completely lost, um, and you have to ask a question right away because we've we've lost you, um, feel free to just unmute yourself and speak up. And also when we solicit questions, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, so this section is going to be pretty short. It's just about the most common machine learning methods that are used in weather and climate. So next slide. So the um, I, I think I'm going to talk about three or four, yeah, four common machine learning methods that are used in weather and climate. So the first common one is linear slash logistic regression. It's a simple method, but it's often really powerful, especially when you're doing multivariate linear logistic regression. So multivariate just means you have more than one predictor. So anyone who's taken um, high school statistics or undergrad statistics probably remembers the Y equals MX plus B equation. That's when you're doing just univariate linear regression. So X is your single predictor, and then M is the slope, and B is the bias or the intercept and then y is the output or the thing you're trying to predict. Um, so that's univariate linear regression, but you can do multivariate linear or multivariate logistic regression where you have hundreds or thousands of predictors, and often that does well enough for whatever your application is, especially if the, um, if the relationship it's itself that actually exists in the data is close enough to linear. Um, and linear and logistic regression have been used in atmospheric science since at least the 1950s, maybe even further back than that. Um, the second uh, second type of method is tree ensemble methods, so random forest and gradient boosted forests. These are just um, collections of decision trees. So if you use a single decision tree, this is something we're going to cover in lecture three in much more detail, um, and you'll see some examples in Python code. So when you train a single decision tree, um, often what happens is that the single decision tree really terribly overfits your training data and then generalizes really poorly when you give it new data. Um, so it ends up not being useful outside of the training data. But one way to uh, correct that fault of decision trees is to ensemble a whole bunch of decision trees into a forest. 
um, which can be a random forest or a gradient boosted forest. And uh, when you ensemble these decision trees, the individual decision trees still overfit your training data, but they often overfit in different ways. So each decision tree itself has a really huge bias, but the biases offset each other. And when you ensemble a hundred or a thousand of these trees together, they actually create a, uh, a decent model when you put them into a forest. Um, so one thing that's nice about random forest 2A here is that there's very few parameters to choose, so you don't have to um, you don't have to play with thousands of different configurations of a random forest to get a good one. They're a moderately complex model, so a random forest is more complex than linear or log regression, but it's not as complex as a convolutional neural net, for example. Um, and one thing that's good about that is uh, again, there's there's not too many parameters for the user to choose a priori, and also uh, the computational complexity for training a random forest isn't too bad so you don't need um, super advanced hardware to do it. Um, random forests do pretty well at modeling nonlinear relationships, and um, random forests are usually a good method to pick if you, um, if you have data that's tabular as opposed to gridded data. So when you have data that comes as grids or images, you generally want to use a machine learning method that can, um, that can identify spatial structure in grids or images. That's when you go for convolutional neural networks or anything else with convolution. But if you have tabular data, that's just um, a bunch of numbers that don't necessarily have any spatial or temporal structure. Um, so if you have something like, um, for example, if you're trying to predict scattering off aerosol particles and your predictors may be something like the size of the particle, the shape of the particle, the wavelength of the incoming radiation, et cetera, et cetera, that's data that's not on a grid, so it doesn't have any kind of spatial structure. Um, so you wouldn't really gain anything by using convolution there. Um, so for that kind of tabular data, Random forests are often a really good choice. And then gradient boosted forests are often a really good choice too. So that's model 2B. Um, gradient boosted forests, as you can probably guess from the name, are similar to random forests. They're, um, they're a little bit fancier, and I'm gonna leave that purposely vague for now because you're gonna learn more about both random and gradient boosted forests in session three, so in a couple weeks from now. Um, so the advantage of gradient boosted forests is they usually make better predictions than random forests. The disadvantage is that they're more computationally expensive, um, especially during the training phase. So when you're training or learning the model, it takes uh, a significantly longer time to train a gradient boosted forest than to train a random forest. But at inference time, once you have the model trained and the weights are frozen and you're just applying it to new data, gradient boosted forests take a little bit longer, but not too much longer than a random forest. Um, so next slide, please. So the third, oh, I guess we skipped a number here. Okay, third, third type of model, fourth type of model, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> third Sorry, type of model. Mistake. <laughs> I, I messed up the numbering, it's number three. Never mind. we don't have a number four. <laughs> Things happen. Um, so the third type of model that you'll often see in atmospheric science is neural networks. So there's, um, and this is in one of our sessions, I believe it's gonna be session four, where you're gonna learn all about neural networks. So there's the traditional type of neural network that takes data pixel by pixel, um, and we call those dense neural networks or fully connected neural networks. So those traditional neural nets work really well if your data is tabular. So again, not in gridded form or image form. Um, Whereas if you have gridded data or image data, uh, for example, if you've got output from a numerical weather model, that's always going to be on a grid, whether it's one dimensional if you're looking at vertical profiles, or it can be two dimensional if you're just looking at the horizontal, or it can be three dimensional if you're looking at everything. Um, but any time that you have data on a spatial grid, you generally want to use convolutional neural networks these days instead of traditional neural networks. Um, so next slide. Okay, so a little more AI vocabulary because you're going to see this um, often throughout the course and, and out there in the literature as well. So ANNs or just NNs are artificial neural networks. Um, people use ANN to contrast artificial neural nets with biological neural nets that are in actual meat brains. So that's why the A is there. Um, yeah, so these, mes these methods are really versatile and really powerful and they can be seen as a universal function generator. So I think there's mathematical proof showing that if you have a, a neural network with enough hidden layers and, um, and enough nonlinear activation functions in there, you're going to learn about all that vocabulary in a few weeks from now. Um, there's mathematical proof showing that if you have a complex enough neural network, it can um, approximate any, any mathematical function to, um, to any degree of accuracy if you train it for long enough. And then DL is deep learning. 
Uh, deep learning methods are usually fancy types of neural networks or artificial neural networks, so ANNs. Um, the two things that separate deep learning from non-deep learning are that the neural nets used in deep learning typically have a lot of layers. Uh, the neural nets that I use for my work on a daily basis often have dozens of layers, so we're talking 20, 30, 40, whereas traditional neural nets usually have only two, three, four layers. Um, six layers for a traditional neural net would be seen as a lot. So that's one of the things separating deep learning from non-deep learning. And then another thing that separates deep learning is that uh, the, the neural nets and other methods you use in deep learning are able to learn from spatial grids because they do convolution. Um, so that brings us to the next method, which is CNNs or convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural nets are a type of deep learning. So they're a type of ANN that specializes in learning from spatial grids. So they can learn spatial structures if you have, um, if, if you feed gridded data into them. Um, RNNs are recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural nets, um, I'll, I'll also say that you can combine convolution with recurrence. So you can build a, an RCNN or CRNN, a convolutional recurrent neural network. In that case, you have a neural net that can identify spatial structures and gridded data, and it can also identify temporal structures and time series. And the reason they're called recurrent neural nets is that they feed, um, an RNN feeds its output back into its input layer. So you, you have this loop. Every time it generates an output, that output comes back into the input layer as a predictor. So it's able to learn time series. It's able to learn um, patterns that occur over the last few time steps. Um, and some other fancy types of neural networks, these generally fall into the realm of deep learning as well, are GAN and LSTMs. So GANs are generative adversarial networks. People use GANs to, um, to generate fictitious data. So for example, you can use a GAN to generate a fictitious tropical cyclone or a fictitious extratropical cyclone or a fictitious thunderstorm. Um, I've done that a lot, fictitious radar images, et cetera, et cetera. You can use GANs to generate fake weather data. And often if you set them up correctly, they give you really realistic fake weather data. Um, and then LSTM, the last acronym on this page is long short-term memory. And that's another way of dealing with uh, temporal patterns. So if you have time series data, you may want to use an RNN, or in some cases, you may you may want to use an LSTM. And uh, depending on where we get and what feedback we get throughout this course, lecture six, um, that's the one that still is to be determined in terms of topics. We may talk about RNNs and GANs and LSTMs in that final lecture, but we're definitely going to talk about CNNs in um, lecture five, so that'll be four weeks from now. So I'll turn it back over to you, Ema, I think, for the beginning of section four. All right, any questions? Hi, Nina. this is Ryan Pettigrew out in Kansas City. I had a quick question for Ryan. He talked a lot about um, preferred methods for tabular data versus gridded data and spatial data. Do you, do you have a preferred method that uses both by chance? Yeah, uh, so I've had applications where I have some data that's spatial and then some data that's just tabular. Um, so as an example, when I'm uh, I, I'm doing a radiative transfer project right now, so some of the inputs that are going into my machine learning model are, are vertical profiles, so they're on a grid. I mean, it's just a 1D grid, but it's still a grid. And then some of the data that I have are just scalar um, sing single point values like surface albedo and the solar zenith angle and the latitude and the longitude and the time of day and the time of year, et cetera. Um, and there's ways that uh, that you can take tabular data and gridded data and combine them. Uh, usually I end up doing that inside a convolutional neural network as well. But there's other machine learning methods where you can combine tabular and gridded data and have them both go into the model at once. And you can have the model handle the tabular data in one way and handle the gridded data in another way and combine them to make a final prediction. Great, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, something we deal with in uh, the aviation industry a lot. And uh, any assistance we can get on that, that'd be great. Okay, great. Feel free to ask me questions later on. I'm not sure if we're going to go... Um, if we're going to cover that specific type of thing in this course. Um, but if you want to talk about it later, I'm totally free. All right. And, you know, keep in mind the whole point of this is also to establish a common vocabulary so that it is easier for all of us to talk to each other. So that if there's somebody at Sierra who wants to do something in machine learning, at least we now have a little bit of a common vocabulary after this course, and it's easier to, to establish collaborations with us, for example. 
Um, so that that is a big part of it's not just to teach you this vocabulary and then everybody goes their own way, but we're hoping that this will also bring people a little bit more together and start more collaborations on different topics. All right. Part four, we want to show you some sample implications of machine learning. And it says here at CIRA and NOR, I should also say series, because basically what Ryan and I did for this is we just asked the people around us, let's say, what are you working on? Give us a slide each and we'll present it. So we have 10 slides that we collected from CIRA, from NOR GSL, and from series. So this is just one, one line office from NOR. It doesn't represent everything from NOR. And in, in any case, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just you know, a group of us and what we're working on. So application one, this is Chris Locum and John Neff, who are at NOAA here in Fort Collins, working with us at CIRA. And they have been working on creating synthetic microwave imagery from GOES R imagery. And the motivation really here is that GOES has high temperature, high uh, temporal resolution. And, um, and those satellites that have microwave do not. And so if you want to be able to figure out the internal structure of a tropical cyclone while it develops, if you just have a satellite come over it maybe twice a day, that's just not going to be enough for the scientists to figure this out. So their idea was, well, can we train a neural network, or in this case, a random forest algorithm, I should say, can we train a machine learning algorithm, in this case, random forest, to take in ghost imagery and convert it to a synthetic microwave image. So what you see here on the left is the ghost imagery, water vapor. In the middle, you see what the actual microwave imagery looks like at that moment. And on the right, you see what the algorithm spit out that was trained, that just got ghosts as input and then generated this from that. So you basically train the neural network algorithm on these pairs and you try to train it such that this, the one on the right is as much as possible like the one in the middle because then you suddenly get the synthetic images that give you microwave images every few minutes, which would be really cool for tropical cyclone researchers. Okay, so uh, next application. So application two, uh, Kyle Hilburn is the lead and I've been helping him on this, was to generate synthetic radar images from ghost channels. It's a similar motivation. Ghost is available everywhere in corners but MIMS or radar is not available in mountain regions or over the ocean. And so the idea again is here on the left, you see the input images in this case, four different ghost channels, including lightning. So it's channel seven, nine, 13, and the lightning channel that goes into our, in this case, neural network and out comes an output image on the bottom. Um, so on the bottom right, you see the actual observed MIMS, and on the left, you see a much more fuzzy version, but still something you can kind of recognize that the neural network spit out, just trained on, the neural network only sees the ghost imagery once it's, once it's tra been trained. So that's the idea here, which is the similar problems, but this one uses convolution neural net networks. All right, application three also comes from CIRA, that's John Haynes and Yu Jong-no who are here on the bottom. And they've been working on an algorithm that detects low clouds from ghost ABI or VIRS. And the idea just being quite often when you have ghost imagery, the top clouds kind of hide the bottom clouds and they're really hard to make out. So the existing CCL algorithm that you see on the left over here um, predicted, predicted certain different cases and you see the colors here, but for example, it had this blue a lot that says high and so H and M means uh, there's a high and a medium height cloud. So it was predicting blue a lot, while if you see on the right over here, once they used machine learning, in this case, case random forest, you get a lot more purple because they discovered that there was actually a low cloud below that. So this one then says, oh, this is a high, a medium, and a low cloud. And similarly, there were lots of cases where before it just said there was a high cloud, so this color that was turned then into high and low, which is this color. So you see this one much more. All right. Application number four comes from Yun Jin Lee, who is at CSU in atmospheric science, but also with CIRA, Chris Como and myself. And the idea here is that we were trying to detect convective regions from GO16 imagery. Um, and the, uh, the method used here is also conversion neural networks. Um, and the idea was to take as input the GOES-16 data, several different channels, and as output, 
to get the representation of the convective flag of MIMS. So that's not just taking the brightness temperature or any threshold or something like this, but taking a much more complex definition of convection and trying to predict what MIMS does over here, here from ghost imagery. Um, a slightly different, so again, here, this is just for classification of what you see right now. And the application being that whenever you have convection, you have uh, latent heating, and it would be nice to feed this latent heating information from the from the current ghost satellites directly into the non-magnetic weather prediction models because they're not so good at modeling latent heating. So that's the idea here. Turning it over to Ryan. Okay, so the next application involves me. I just started working on this project a month ago, so there's some super preliminary results up here. And uh, also Jeb Stewart at NOAA GSL and Christina Kumler at NOAA slash series. So what we're doing here is forecasting convective initiation and decay from Himawari 8 satellite data. Himawari 8 covers the Western Pacific, so specifically we're doing a region around Taiwan. Um, I apologize, there's no base map in this uh, this plot here. I was on a supercomputer where I couldn't download the base map package, so uh, another work in progress. Um, but anyways, the current method that we're using is UNETs, which are uh, they're a type of convolutional neural network that do pixel-wise prediction. So if you have gridded input data and your output data also needs to be on a grid, then often the best way to go is use UNETs rather than using a typical CNN. So if you use a typical CNN, it will take in a whole bunch of gridded data. But generally, if you if there's only one value you want to predict from that gridded data, you use a CNN. So if I were, uh, for example, looking at these satellite images, and if the question were just, is there a thunderstorm, yes or no, that's only one value that I need to predict. So I would probably use a CNN for that application. Whereas in this case, I'm trying to predict at every single grid cell in this grid that's 230 by 220 or something like that. So I have 50,000 grid cells and at each grid cell I need to predict is there convection here, is there convection here, is there convection here. So when you need to do that kind of pixel-wise prediction and give an answer at every single grid cell, often UNETs are the best method. So that's what we're using here. Um, what you're seeing here in the example that I'm showing, I just grabbed this from a random time. Um, and this is currently predicting with the lead time of zero. Eventually, what we're hoping to do is extend the lead time for convective initiation and decay, maybe up to two hours. Um, beyond that, we're not sure if we're going to get any skill. But this was a, a very preliminary experiment. So what I did was uh, I took in satellite data from seven different bands that were taken from the Himawari 8 satellite. So just seven different spectral, spectral bands. I had brightness temperature for every single band. And then I fed those into this unit. And then the, um, the question being asked was, uh, at each grid cell, is there convection right now at the present time? And uh, to create the labels or the correct answers, I used radar data and just thresholded that at 35 dBz. So if the uh, composite reflectivity was at least 35 dBz, it was called convection. And if not, it was called no convection. Um, so what you're seeing here on this grid is just the, um, the predicted probability at every single grid cell from the UNET. So this is based on the satellite data. Does it think there's convection at that grid cell? And then the black dots show you where convection actually occurs. So generally, the, uh, the black dots line up with the higher probabilities, the blues and the purples and the reds and whatnot. Um, next slide, please. And that, I think, is just another example. Yeah, that's an example from a different time step where it didn't perform quite as well. The black dots don't line up quite as well with the higher probabilities. Um, so like I said, work in progress. Um, next slide, and I think it's back to you, Ima. Yes. So here are a few applications that Christina Kumler sent me, who works at NOAA GSL, but also Sirius. Uh, and then it involves Christina. So this one involves Christina Kumler, uh, Ravan Amadov, and Jeb Stewart. And also, uh, Christina Kumler, before she got married, had the last name Bonfanti. So you may see some of this publication from the Kumler and some under Bonfanti, same person. Um, the application here was to derive estimates of fire radiative power over time. So basically a time series. Um, and the problem being that usually the, the standard way to model this is just like one fixed curve. And so this is a diurnal cycle. If you see this, this plot on the left, uh, it's basically on the on the x-axis is zero to 24 hours. And apparently, usually people just take a constant profile and just put that in there in their models. Turns out that's not really a very good model 
Um, and so Christina was using a random forest to come up with a profile that you see here on the right, which is also a 24-hour profile, but as you can see, the blue line here is quite different from the red one. And so this model takes as input things like latitude and longitude, or the FRP value that comes in, and a bunch of other things. And a random forest then helps you to predict this, this uh, time series. So in this case, this is actually the first example where the output isn't an image. The output is a time series in this case. And again, you use this random forest, and you would run this for every point that you have separately, feed in these values, and then you would get for that day this kind of curve. Uh, the next application also comes comes from Christina and Jeb Stewart and David Hall and Mark Robert. So this is about tropical and extra tropical cyclone regions of interest. So what's happening here? Usually when you see people presenting machine learning algorithms, you already have this input, this nicely centered tropical cyclones. But that's not how the data comes to us. Somehow, somewhere must be an algorithm that actually cuts this area out of the global map or whatever map you have and figures out, oh, where are these regions of interest? Where do we have tropical cyclones that we should be analyzing? Um, and so they um, train a machine learning algorithm on things like the IBR tracks and similar algorithms and found that the machine learning algorithm could be, become pretty good at automatically picking out the region of interest and then delivering that to the user so that you can do additional analysis with that. And they have a very nice paper on that. Application 8 is very similar. It's done by Gary Lane, also at NOAA GSN series. It also deals with tropical, extratropical cyclone regions of interest, but they use a very different, well, a, a more complex algorithm. So they use a GAN. This is actually so far the only example that uses a GAN, which is a generative adversarial network, which we may or may not get to in section six, in lecture six, depending on your interest, um, but it gave pretty good results. Moving on to the last two applications, which both estimate vertical profiles. So I will turn it back over to Ryan. Okay, so this is my other postdoc project, a little less preliminary. So this involves me, Dave Turner at NOAA GSL, Jeb Stewart, Ima, and Christina Kumler, who you've uh, you've heard about most of those people already in these applications. So we're using machine learning to accelerate the radiative transfer scheme that's used in dynamical weather and climate models. So I'll give a little background on just what the problem is and why we're trying to do this. Current numerical weather and climate models use a radiative transfer parameterization. So the radiative transfer is handled outside of the dynamical core. There's a radiative transfer model, usually the RRTM or RRTMG. You've probably heard those acronyms that are run separately in every grid column of the, uh, of the numerical model. And the, uh, the problem with the RRTM and the RRTMG and basically every other radiative transfer scheme that's used these days is that they're really slow. So because they're really slow, they can't be called at every time step inside the NWP model. They're actually called more like every 20 time steps. And for the intervening 19 time steps, the NWP model just assumes that all radiative properties stay constant. And obviously that's a bad thing that reduces the accuracy of your NWP model as a whole when it has to assume that radiation just stays constant for 15 minutes straight or whatever 20 model time steps ends up being. Um, and also, even when you only run the, radi the, the radiative transfer scheme every 20 time steps, it still ends up accounting for about half the computation of the NWP model. So 50% of the computation is just doing radiative transfer. Um, so what we're trying to do is train uh, Machine learning, specifically, we're using your, uh, we're using UNETs again, and um, we're trying to to train a UNET to emulate the RRTM or the Rapid Radiative Transfer Model. So we want the UNET to be just as accurate as the RRTM, but uh, if we're successful with this, the UNET will be a lot faster than the RRTM. I think the UNETs I currently have are 1,000 to 10,000 times faster than the RRTM. So if we could successfully integrate that into an NWP model, we could call the radiative radiative transfer every time step and not every 20 time steps. Um, so there's just a few examples of predictions being made by the UNET. I, th I think only two examples. So on this slide, um, on the left-hand side, you can see a few of the predictors that go into the UNET. These are vertical profiles running from zero to 50 kilometers above ground. So in the green, you can see the liquid water content. That's just the straight line because uh, liquid water content is zero everywhere. So this is a clear sky case. There's no ice water or liquid water in this profile. 
and then in the purple curve you can see the relative humidity the black curve you can see the temperature and the uh, the orange curve you can see the specific humidity and then if you look on the right hand side the solid line is the actual shortwave heating rate so we're doing only shortwave here although we're adding long wave at a certain point as well um, so the solid line is showing you the actual shortwave heating rate at every height and the dashed line is showing you the unit predicted shortwave heating rate at every height and it's uh, really really close no differences more than uh, 0 0.05 kelvins per day maybe and then next slide so this is just another example for a more difficult case on the left hand side you're seeing the same predictor variables so there's temperature specific and relative humidity and then there's liquid water content in the green in this case we actually do have liquid water and it's probably hard to see with the size of the image here but there's two spikes in the liquid water content so there's one around five kilometers above ground and another one around two kilometers so there's these two big spikes in the liquid water content which represent a double layer cloud and with this double layer cloud the unit doesn't do quite as well so it um if i'm looking at these lines correctly it over predicts the amount of shortwave heating that occurs with the lower cloud layer and it slightly under predicts the amount of heating that occurs with the upper cloud layer so work to be done as there always is um next slide and i think it's back to you ema Yes, and that's our last application, also vertical profiles. And this is an application worked on by Jason Stock, Jack Dostelag, Louis Grasso, and myself. And the idea here is to use machine learning to improve the vertical profiles of temperature and moisture that are delivered by numerical weather prediction models such as RAP. And the motivation really comes if you look at the left side here. So the RAP is your red line, so that's your numerical weather prediction. And the black is your radio sound for the same point in time and location and you know rep does pretty well but it's not perfect so the question we were asking is can machine learning help us to get some even better results can we basically take rep as an input or machine learning algorithm feed in some other information and then make it better and we just started working on this but preliminary results always show that we can improve it somewhat uh, and the other things we're feeding in is rtma data uh, we're feeding in again the wrap is an input and we're also feeding in some ghost channels and you know just having a master student jason stock work on this for a few months he can already come up with better results on a little bit on the right hand side where you see um, this gives you rmse between wrap and the radio sound is red and then blue is between the machine learning output and the radio sound and you can see that the rmse is already a good bit smaller but again, we've just started, we don't even have all the training data downloaded. So this is based on very few samples. And this is preliminary work, but we get the impression that with machine learning, we can, without much expense, we could take the output of RAP and improve it further to look more like radio sounds. And of course, we're of course most interested in how it performs close to the close to the ground because it's really important for aviation. And especially there, we can train our machine learning algorithms to have a smaller uh, error there. Okay. Turning it back over to Wayne. All right. I think before I do this, uh, did I send a link to the CoLab notebook to everyone in the um, in the group email the other day? Because if I haven't done that, I should do that now. Just to um, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Go ahead. I don't think you did that. So. Okay. Yeah, okay. Can you send an email, Rand, please, into the chat? Uh, yeah, I think I can do that too. Yeah. Just do both. I think it's already in the okay. chat now. And if you just send it to the Google list, that should work. Yeah, I'd prefer an email too. Okay. Okay. It's just, just easier to email. deal with than, than picking it out right now and then finding okay. it later. Yep, I get you. Okay. So everyone should have that link now um, between the chat and the email that was just sent for um, for a few minutes from now. So uh, going back to this this flow chart, this this tree thing that we were looking at earlier, uh, you've already seen this before. So this is just showing you the machine learning methods that are going to be covered later in the course. And um, if you can go to the to the next slide, Emma, I'll just read off that one. All right, so lecture one is today, your gentle introduction to machine learning. And then um, apparently I have to approve my own message to the, uh, the Google group. I'll do that now so everyone uh, gets that. Uh, proof. 
Okay, that email should go through now. Um, so lecture two, we're going to cover some some basic concepts in machine learning, and then we're going to cover some methods as well. So the methods covered will be the most basic ones, linear and logistic regression, and the concepts covered will be uh, some really important stuff to to get you started in machine learning. So that that'll be uh, the most important foundational stuff is going to be in lecture two. So we're going to be talking about underfitting, overfitting, uh, normalizing your data, and then model evaluation, and basically how to do it properly and how to avoid the pitfalls that you often see in papers. Um, so uh, so tr splitting your, your data into independent training validation and testing sets, and then making sure that you evaluate your model really rigorously to identify where the deficiencies are. That's something we're going to talk about a lot in lecture two. And then lecture three, we're going to talk mostly about methods instead of concepts. Um, I mean, there will be concepts in there as well. Uh, so we'll be talking about decision trees and then ensembles of decision trees, which are the random and gradient boosted forests that we touched on a little bit earlier. And we're going to talk about two types of clustering, which are k-means and hierarchical. Then lecture four, we're going to talk about fully connected neural networks or the, the traditional type of neural nets that don't do convolution. And we're going to start talking about machine learning interpretation methods, which I think is going to be really fun for people. It's a way to um, to look at even a really complex black box machine learning model that, that no human could possibly look at the millions of weights and figure out what the machine learning model is doing. But there's these ad hoc interpretation methods you can apply to even a really complex machine learning model to um, to basically interrogate and poke at and query the machine learning learning model, and you can ask the machine learning model, why did you do that? Why did you why did you predict 99% tornado probability for this storm, but only 2% tornado probability for that storm? Um, so these, I, I think, what's exciting about these interpretation methods is that they're mostly model agnostic, and you can apply them to any model, whether it's really basic or really complex. Um, so in lecture four, we're going to talk about two of those interpretation methods, which are the permutation test and saliency mapping. And then in lecture five, we're going to talk about class activation mapping and backwards optimization, where you can um, basically in backwards optimization, you run a neural net backwards. So instead of um, the way you typically apply a neural net, you put you put in your input. So for example, if you have a storm, you want to know the probability that the storm is going to give you severe weather, you put that your radar image or whatever you're data you have for the storm, you put that data into the neural net and then it spits out an answer at the other end and it'll tell you this storm has a 75% probability of severe weather or 20 or 90 or whatever that may be. But in backwards optimization, you run the neural net the other way and you can try to create a prototypical storm. So you can create a storm that minimizes severe weather probability. You can tell the neural net, give, create a fictitious storm for me with 0% probability of severe weather, create the most innocuous unthreatening storm you possibly can. And you can also tell the neural net, create a storm with 100% probability of severe weather. So create the most threatening, menacing storm that you possibly can. And it's uh, it's really interesting to see what comes out at the other end when you get this fictitious weather data out of the neural net. Um, so there's lots of cool stuff you're going to see with, these, with the interpretation methods. And also in lecture five, the main um, machine learning model type we're going to talk about will be convolutional neural networks. So that's the type of neural net that can learn from spatial grids. And then uh, in lecture six, that's all to be determined. So it depends on your feedback. Uh, we have a few ideas right now, but I'm not even going to mention them. We're going to, um, I don't want to, I, I don't want to influence the feedback that we get. So we're, we're going to see what people want and that's going to determine what goes into lecture six. And one thing that I forgot to mention at the end of the applications, I actually went to the 10 applications and I counted how many times there was random forest and all these different things. And I thought seeing this, the lectures here uh, might make more sense if you know how often we have the different things. So out of the 10 applications that we had, and of course, you know, this is very much biased towards, towards data that uses images because Theo does a lot of image processing with satellite data and stuff. But still, we had, the desired output in seven of the 10 cases was an image, in two it was a vertical profile, and in one it was a temperature profile, so a scalar time series. Um, five of the methods were regression methods where you try to estimate a continuous value, and five were classification methods where you try to estimate our specific state or the probability of that state, so really half and half in our case. And then as far as the methods are concerned, so we were using random forest, so that's really lecture number three. And then six, we're using 
are relatively simple convolutional neural networks, often the UNET, which is really lecture five, but you can't do lecture five without lecture four. So that's why we're doing lecture four and lecture five. And then one was using a very complex uh, convolutional neural network again. But other than that, I mean, the methods that you saw in the applications, except for the GAN, which we may or may not do in lecture number six, everything else is pretty much covered in here. So I just wanted to throw that in before we continue. All right. All right, should I share my screen now? Would that be the easiest yeah, way to do that? things? Yes, that's the easiest thing. Let me stop my screen share. Okay. All right, go ahead. So I'm, I'm assuming you can see a Colab notebook now? We can now. Okay, so yes. this is just a, a really simple Colab notebook. It's just for people who haven't used them before just to get you into the swing of things because you're going to be using Colab notebooks for probably the last 30 minutes of each, each lecture in the future. So it's going to be 60 minutes of myself and Ema talking and taking questions and then 30 minutes of looking at a Colab notebook and also, also taking questions. So this is just to get your feet wet. Um, this code doesn't do anything really super interesting, but just to show you how to run a collab notebook. Um, so I'm hoping that everyone got the link between the chat and the uh, group email I just sent out. If someone still can't access the link, um, feel free to speak up in the chat or with audio. Um, so the first thing you want to do when you go to a collab notebook is click connect at the top and this will connect you to a virtual runtime. So basically it's a, it's a fancy cloud computer owned by Google that's not yours and all the computation being done on this notebook when you run the code is not being done in your computers. So that's a really nice thing, especially if you, um, like me, don't have a super fast computer or if you have scripts running in the background or whatever it may be, um, you don't have to deal with the, the computing power. Um, so the uh, what, what we're gonna do in the first code cell here, uh, yeah, I'll read some of this stuff off. So the next code cell is going to download a Git repository called Sierra ML short course. So that contains all the code that we're using for this course. And uh, I think the repository is currently private, but I um, will we'll talk about how to share that with everyone because I don't want to have to add um, all 70 participants of this class as, as collaborators on the GitHub repository. But maybe that's actually the best thing to do. Either way, we'll make sure that, um, that people can access this code so that it's all open source. Um, so the next code cell here actually just uh, just does a git clone, so it'll download that repository. And that repository contains all the Python code that'll be used throughout this course, so for lectures one through six. Um, and again, the repository is downloaded to a virtual machine and not your local machine. So it's the, uh, the fancy cloud computer that Google owns that you're connected to. And the Python code um, when so there's this uh, this Python setup.py install command that installs all the Python code in that library, and that's also done on the virtual machine. Um, another really nice thing about Colab is that most of the packages you typically use for, for atmospheric science or data processing are already installed. Uh, so NumPy, X-Array, Pandas, Keras, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, uh, NetCDF4, et cetera, et cetera. Those libraries are already installed. So basically, the only thing we have to install here is the uh, the Sierra ML short course library that I've created for this course. Um, for people who aren't familiar with virtual machines, I'll just talk about them for another minute. So there's some big advantages of using a virtual machine. Um, one is that it's not yours. So like I said, the processing won't slow down your local machine at all. Um, they're pretty fast, the ones owned by Google, especially if you request a virtual machine with a graphical processing unit or GPU. And you're gonna to wanna to do that for lecture five. So we're not gonna to get to that for another four weeks. But actually, um, I was gonna show you how to do that. And now the uh, the menu has disappeared on me. Well, okay, we'll get to that in lecture five then. Um, so you can, uh, the, the runtime that I'm connected to right now is just a typical CPU, but you can request a GPU as well if you're doing some really heavy lifting with convolutional neural nets. And uh, like I said, there's minimal setup. Anaconda, Python, and the main Python libraries are already installed on this virtual machine. Um, the main disadvantage of using a virtual machine is that files will disappear as soon as your session is over. And also, if you leave the session idle, so if you just open up a Colab notebook and then you go to another tab and do some other stuff, 
for 15 to 30 minutes, the session will terminate on you. And then any file you've created during the session is lost and you've just got to restart the session. Um, any modifications you make to the code during the session, those will be saved, but files you create will not be saved. Um, so during the session, if you create a file that you really want, for example, you've trained a machine learning model that, that you think is really good and you want to keep it for future use, you can save files from, you can get them from the virtual machine and drag them down to your local machine and save them forever. Um, so you would use this code here. So you just, uh, you import this this files module from google.colab and then you go files.download, whatever the path is on the virtual machine. So if the file path is content slash foo slash bar slash text, you go files.download slash content slash foo slash bar uh, dot text. Um, so it's pretty easy. So we'll actually run this code cell now. So this is the code cell that downloads the Git repository, the Sierra ML short course. Do you and want to tell people how you, how you run a cell? Just if you've never done it before. Oh, oh yes, how, how you run a cell, yeah. Um, yes. I've, <laughs> I'm forgetting that people aren't in the same room and can't see the, the keys that I'm typing. Um, so how you run a cell is you can uh, you can hit this play button here or you can go uh, control plus enter and I think shift plus enter also works. Um, so yeah, three different ways to run a code cell. So you should be able to run that code cell with no problems. Um, and the nice thing is that we're all connected to fancy virtual machines on the Google side, so no one should have issues where, you know, their their Python installation or their Anaconda installation isn't configured correctly and it screws up. Um, and the next code cell here is just importing some of the common packages that are used in Python. In this case, we're only importing NumPy and Matplotlib. And the Colab notebooks you'll see for future lectures that this, this will be um, maybe 15 or 20 lines of imports. So we're going to be importing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but note that I didn't have to install NumPy or Matplotlib. They already came on the virtual machine. Um, and then this next code cell, so you want you you need to run this code cell before you can do the next one. So hit Shift Enter, Control Enter, whatever your favorite keyboard combination is. Um, this next code cell does some simple math, uh, just so you have an example of a code cell actually computing something rather than just importing and downloading packages. So this next code cell just uh, it takes in the the side lengths of a right triangle and then it computes the hypotenuse length. So you're just using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, nothing super fancy. The square root of the sum of squares, c squared equals a, plus, a, squared, a squared plus b squared or whatever the formula is. Um, so you have side lengths of 3 and 4. 3 squared plus 4 squared is 25 and the square root of that is 5. So your hypotenuse length should be 5 and the printout here shows you that it is. So things are going well. And then the final code cell in this notebook is just, just showing you how to create a plot. If you want, uh, if you're creating a plot in a Colab notebook and you actually want it to show up inside the notebook, you need this uh, this magic statement, this percent matplotlib inline has to be run somewhere in the notebook. So I do that up here before all my imports. That's usually where people do it in a Colab notebook, although I think you can do it wherever you want. So I always go percent matplotlib inline, and that makes sure whenever you create a plot, it shows up directly in the notebook. So again, you can run this code cell. Um, all I'm doing here is I'm randomly sampling a, a million values. One E6 is 10 to the power of six. So a million values I'm ran randomly sampling from a Gaussian distribution with mean of zero and standard deviation of one. And then I'm creating a histogram of those values I randomly sampled, and the histogram should look fairly close to a standard normal distribution. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but if it looks like a gamma or something weird, then obviously uh, something has gone wrong. So again, you can run this code cell with shift enter, control enter, hit the play button, whatever you want to do, and it gives you a standard normal distribution. And if you run this code cell again, each time the histogram is going to look a bit different because you're randomly sampling values, but it should always look like close enough to a standard normal distribution. And then if you if you want to really make it robust, maybe you sample 10 million values instead of 1 million values. And obviously, the more you sample, the closer it's going to be to that standard normal distribution. Um, but anyways, scientifically, there's nothing interesting happening in this Colab notebook whatsoever. It's just showing you uh, how to run code in a Colab notebook. Um, so does anyone have questions? Did anyone have difficulties running the code here? There's a chance that something went wrong when I shared this notebook and it screwed up for someone.
Great, thanks, Peter. Mm. All right, did you have anything else, Ryan? I had some closing comments. Okay, uh, nothing I can think of off the top of my head, so I'll let you go first and maybe my thoughts will marinate. Do you want to unshare your screen and then people can also pop their oh, comments yeah. back on if they feel like it? It's always nice to see people. Feel free to, to pop on your camera or not, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, yeah, somebody said it popped a warning at the beginning, but it worked fine. Yeah, there, there are warnings popping up. You can usually ignore them. <laughs> it's often something that in a future version might not be supported or whatever, but as long as it's just a warning, you can usually ignore it. I just want to set the expectations correctly, you know, because um, I'm guilty of saying before, look, we have all these applications and now we're going to cover all this. Don't, of course, don't expect, this is an introductory, introductory course, right? So you will get to know the concepts, you will get to know how they work, but don't expect that at the end of this course, you, you are fully equipped to go on your own and write your big application and in two weeks you can write your first paper. So that's not the expectation you should, you should have. It, what you should expect is that you understand the concept and you can read papers and you know how to vocabulary and you know much better what you might want to learn more about and try out yourself. And then you can reach out for help again and see whether you find collaborators, whether that's us or people in your own teams, but at least you know what you want to be working on. I think that's, Ryan, would you say that's the kind of the expectation we have for this course? I think, yeah, we're uh, we're trying to build up everyone's expertise, but no one is going to become an expert in uh, in six lectures. But uh, yeah, establishing a common ground and a common language and common jargon and and just getting everyone sort of up to speed is the the main goal of this course. So that when you read a paper about random forest neural networks, convolutional neural networks, deep learning, whatever it may be, um, you can not only understand the paper, but also read it critically. And that's um, especially lecture two next week is going to cover some of that. When we talk about model evaluation and overfitting and underfitting, I'm going to talk about uh, things to look for in papers that um, that unfortunately even appear in published papers sometimes that are, that are not great practice. Um, but yeah, what uh, what what we're hoping for is to um, to just give everyone some common ground so that people people know the questions to ask about machine learning. Because what I find these days is that there's so many people who are trying to get into machine learning, but they don't even know where to start. They don't know the right terms to search on Google. They don't know the right questions to ask to the experts. Um, so our hope is that once everyone has gone through this course, you have enough vocabulary and you have enough of a foundation that if you then, um, if you want to become a practitioner and you want to incorporate machine learning into your own work, you sort of know what to do next. So you may not already be equipped to take on a project all on your own and, you know, and lead a project on machine learning, but you'll be equipped to to know what methods are out there, what might be the right method for the job, what questions to ask, who to ask the questions to, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, Ryan loves to answer questions, so feel free to email him. <laughs> and you'll probably hear more from Ryan than from me because we also decided, number one, Ryan has this wonderful um, Jupyter Notebooks that are, I have Jupyter Notebooks too, but they don't go into examples as much as his do. So we decided to take his more. And besides, I've given lectures to Sierra, just Sierra for clients last, last fall, and so we thought we flip it a little so it's interesting for people to hear the same material again, but from a different instructor. So you'll hear more from Ryan and from me, just as a heads up. Any questions or suggestions? Hi, this is Chandra Pasias. Um, I'm over at uh, Chris Kumaro's group. I was curious where we will provide the input for what topics might be decided upon for that last lecture. Just email us. I think it's the easiest. Email Ryan or me. We share. Okay, I wasn't sure, so I just figured I'd check. Yeah, either one. We talk to each other, right? I mean, Ryan and I talk at least once a week to each other, so, and we would also forward emails. So if you send it to one of us, it will reach the other person too, or send it to both of us. That works for me too. Any other questions or suggestions? Uh, I would like to know whether the slide deck per lecture will be made available. Yeah, we'll make that available. Right, Wayne? Yeah. 
Um, I'm not sure if we talked about how we'll make it available. Maybe just uh, emailing or establishing a shared Google Drive or something. I will say the wonderful thing about GoToMeeting, um, and we recorded this, and GoToMeeting actually extracts all the sites and puts them at the bottom of the recording. And the wonderful thing about that is that you can actually click on the site and we'll jump to that part of the presentation. So if you just want to watch one thing again, you can look for the slides, you click on it, and it takes you right there. And we will share every week after the presentation, we will share the link to the GoToMeeting recording. So that's one way to get to the slides too, but that might not be as high quality as the original site. So I, I figure something out to post the slides as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions or suggestions? Hey, Ryan, it's a little bit basic. Um, will that package also work normally on our own PC? I, I guess so, right? There's nothing special about Google Colax except that it provides resources. Yeah, there's nothing special about it except that uh, all the, the the Python the dependencies, so the libraries that that Sierra ML short course library depends on are already installed. I think if you download it to your local machine, the setup.py file will um it'll automatically tell your Anaconda installation that it needs NumPy, Xarray, TensorFlow, Keras, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So installing it on your local machine should also be easy, um, but I'm not 100% sure. You, may, uh, you have three different options. You can either run it with the cloning, or you can run it and save it and have then a copy in your own Google Drive, which then is your copy and you can modify, but it still runs in the cloud, but it's now your copy, which you can modify. And number three is you actually download the Python file and you try to run it on your own machine, but again, you have to set up the whole environment then. Options number one and two do not require any installation. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? Uh, I had a general question. So first, thank you for offering the course. And then um, second is you both have done this, it seems like, for many years now and have a lot of experience. I was just curious if you still struggle in choosing what is the right method. Is that something that becomes more obvious as you get more experience or is it still or is it do you do you both yeah kind of still have issues in always figuring out which is the right tool or right method in terms of all these different options so i would say yes and no <laughs> so number one is you quite often you get a feeling for which kind of problems want what kind of solution, right? So you find a problem that's similar to yours and you look at what worked for that and you try that as your as your first guess maybe. But we also like to build a hierarchy. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying a random forest and a neural network and then see which one works better and whether you actually need the complexity because at the end of the day, you want the simplest method that does the job, not the fanciest. You always want the simplest method that does the job. And so it's actually a good idea to build a hierarchy of different models, but for example, if you choose a neural network, there are so many different options within. So you take, kind of take a first guess based on what other people have used for similar problems, but then you try a lot of different solutions. Ryan, what would you say? I would say the same thing, yeah. I, I would say struggle is probably not the right word, but any time I have a new project that involves machine learning, there's always a, um, I, I guess the jargon would be hyperparameter tuning, which we're going to talk about a little bit next week. Um, actually in the next couple weeks. So there's there's a lot of hyperparameter tuning that goes on, which means not only choosing the correct type of machine learning model, but then choosing the correct settings for that model. So if you're using a neural net, you have to choose how many layers are going to be in the neural net, how many neurons are going to be in each layer, what's the learning rate going to be, how long do you train it, etc. And that's something that, um, like Ema said, there's always, um, once you have enough experience in machine learning, you can usually establish a good starting point. So for um, whenever I have a new project, I say, well, I, I'll, I'll find someone else's work or I'll find some of my own previous work and I'll say, okay, I know that these, a, a neural network with these settings should work pretty decently for this type of problem. So I start with that, but then, um, and, and I use that as sort of a center point to, um, to, to tweak around. So if, if I find that a neural net with three layers has worked really well in the past, I'll say, okay, that's my starting point but I'm also going to play around and try two layers and four layers and five layers and six layers and see if those work better than the baseline. Um, so there's, there's always tweaking to do when you have a new project, figuring out what model with what settings works the best. And the answer is always going to be different 
it all um, it very much depends on the the size of your data and the quality of your data and just the physical problem you're trying to solve and so many other things. Just listening to you, Ryan, there's also yet another feedback loop, right? Because choosing the architecture is one thing, but which variables even should you feed in? So quite often you start and you model it and then you test it and then you say, well, when does it work well? Does it work better at night or during the day? Does it work better for a strong storm or not? Does it, you know, all these kind of factors and then you realize, oh, there's another meteorological piece of information that I'm not even feeding in that seems to be very important because it doesn't work well if I'm, say, further north, right? And then you figure, okay, so maybe I should need to put in the latitude as another variable. So there's this whole design cycle where you start off with your initial guess as your environmental scientist, you know which things you think are most important. And then you feed that in, you build a model, you test it, you see under which condition it works well or doesn't work so well. And that may give you a clue as to what else you should feed in, which then changes your architecture again. So you go round and round. And again, most of your time you actually spend on the data pre-processing, right? I mean, that, the, the fun part is when you get to the algorithm, but you spend like 90% of your time quite often getting the data into the right format so that you can feed it into your machine learning algorithm. Fortunately, all of you are already experts on that. So we don't have to teach you that part. You just have to teach you the other 10%, which is then you sit there, you try this algorithm, you see how it works, you try something else, and you get a feeling on the long run what you should try. If it overfits, what do I do? You know, those things, you develop intuition for that, but it is it is always a lot of trial and error. And the other thing Ryan said before, there's a theorem that says that, for example, a neural network can get as close as, you know, infinitely close to the right fitting for almost any or any function. Yeah, in theory, yes. In practice, fusion exists, but we can't necessarily find it. That's a little detail that the computer scientists don't tell you because you do linear minimization and you don't know whether you get to a local or global minimum. So even though the solution exists, at the end, you don't know whether you found it and you keep on running it again and again. So that's why there's so many things of trial and error in there. There are no guarantees. You really have to try it and see how it works. If it works well enough, that's a good solution. If it doesn't, you keep on trying, see whether you get something better. But there's no perfect solution to any of these things. Not unlike statistical methods you've tried before. I mean, there's so much just different vocabulary between machine learning and statistics. Most of this you've seen before. Just fancy names. All right, it's 2.30. If there's no other question, I would say we should wrap it up to respect everybody's time. I just have one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, sure. I just want to know if um, I know in your all's list of possible algorithms that evolutionary programming is not in there. Is not is that not considered a, uh, an option or an aspect of machine learning? So you mean things like genetic algorithms? Yeah. Okay. So genetic algorithms have a little bit of a comeback. They used a whole lot less. I know that Vladimir Kosnopolsky, for example, had some good experience with them recently. So there are lots of other ones that we don't cover, like support vector machines, genetic algorithms. There are a lot of other ones out there. I think we just picked the ones that are most common. But again, if there's something specific, lecture six is still open. If you absolutely want to have genetic algorithms, we can cover genetic algorithms a little. It really depends on what people want to, want to have and hear. Yeah, I have some material for that as well. So if someone wants to know about genetic algorithms or evolutionary programming, um, e even if it doesn't make it into lecture six, um, if you still want to know about it, just send me an email and I can dig up some old uh, some old lecture slides and examples and stuff like that. Also, uh, Paul Reber at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee does a lot with genetic algorithms. And he's got, um, if you go back and look for his AMS talks from the last few years, you can find some really good stuff. He gives talks that are really... Um, educational as well as showing the results at the same time. So I guess the bottom line is if there's something you want to know, send us email. We may not be able to answer them all, but we try. All right. Thank you so much for coming. This is a great turnout. I love it. So yeah, thanks send everyone. Us your, send us your questions, suggestions, and we will see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank thanks. Bye -bye.